outstanding track record, 114 medals across his decade-long professional career, the flying Scotsman himself, Jimmy Guthrie. And now to the starting line, he's off. Guthrie never was one to explode onto the scene. Rather, he's adored for defying the odds. This goes all the way back to his upbringing in Hoyk, where he had the means to become a racing champion, only an avid cyclist father to spark an interest. From there, Guthrie was called up for the Great War when he turned 18. His love for motorcycling may have begun while serving in Gallipoli, then in Egypt, and later France, reportedly as a dispatch rider. Ur Jimmy's bravery and fearlessness is no luck or coincidence. These are attributes hard earned and tested when facing the hardships of war. Like many of this veteran generation, Jimmy returned with a stoic sensibility. It wasn't long after that he opened an engineering workshop with his brother Archie in Hoyt. It's here that Jimmy spent most of his time in the early years, which undoubtedly bolstered his practical skills. As business started to boom, Guthrie purchased his first bike from Army Surplus and joined the Hoyt and Border Motor Racing Club. It wasn't long before Jimmy recorded his first win at Lantern Hill in the Speed Hill Climb. In mainland Britain, dirt tracks and sand races were where the amateurs had to cut their teeth as road racing wasn't established yet. From Lantern Hill to Newcastle and St Andrews, Guthrie had to impress locally since the established British racing scene was so distant. He earned sponsorship from the Hoyken Border Motor Racing Club to compete on the biggest of stages, the famed Isle of Man TT. Guthrie fired out with the gates in the junior division, but this was not the first outing he, nor the supporters back home, had hoped for. Rather underwhelmingly, was forced to retire his bike in the first lap. Instead, the young Stanley Woods made his mark with his first gold. But in racing, you always expect to tumble. In some sense, this is more fitting for Guthrie's tale. Not a Cinderella story, fortune one. Happenstance, his career and medals were all earned. Guthrie's mark on the TT was at the weight. He competed in smaller, local events, yielding even more success than before, now driven by a desire to get back to the Isle of Man. This practice was not in vain, as Guthrie took gold on the most important races of his career so far, the Scottish Speed Championships, then Chevington Sands. The wins made such an impression that the new Hudson Motorcycle Company, who had dismissed his prior attempts at sponsorship, signed Jimmy up straight after. By this stage, Guthrie's talent on the bike was undeniable, and with some innovation, he pushed himself further. He was one of the first to adopt the flat-to-the-tank technique, which boosts aerodynamics, though demanding great core strength to keep balance and elite bravery since it inhibited the racer's field of vision. Guthrie's career really shifted up a gear with this new Hudson team and provided a second chance at the Isle of Man that he had been waiting for. In the juniors, however, he was once again unable to finish the race due to a broken petrol pipe. But Jimmy wasn't going to let history repeat itself in the seniors. He earned a fantastic silver medal, second only to Bennett of Norton, whose bikes were top of the line at the time. The leading British team recognised Guthrie's talents and brought him in for the new season. Together, they started racing further afield on the European circuit. Much like the Isle of Man TT, however, Jimmy's debut with Norton wasn't easy. Norton had been tinkering with their engines, which reportedly cost them speed and consistency. So much so, that during the 1928 TT, Guthrie and his bike caught a blaze during the standard refueling pit stop. Despite the lackluster start, Guthrie still picked up some silver medals and decided to stay with Norton, only for disaster to strike. A hard tumble threatens Guthrie's career and halts his tour with Norton. He's hospitalised and out of action for the rest of the season. But every cloud, as they say, has a silver lining. It's here, in Hoyt Cottage Hospital, that Jimmy met his wife-to-be, Isabel, who was working as a nurse at the time. A fall at breakneck speeds, off the bike, and into love. Guthrie moved over to race on an AJS for the 1930 season, where his racing shifted up a gear. This was a turning point for Guthrie, illustrated by his return to the Isle of Man. 
where despite being set up on a brand new, lightweight, odd and rare build, he raced a gallant race and finally earned his first win at the one that got away. Jimmy was the dream racer, with a proven track record and no ego. He could now race anywhere he wanted. A German manufacturer even offered him a record breaking fee, but in the end, he opted to stay home in Hoik. Here, he joined Norton Works once again. Despite the expectations that come with the Norton name, the competition was fierce. A renaissance on the mechanical front meant that each season was hotly contested by the racing giants at the time, including BMW and Motoguchi. However, the combined expertise and hunger for success delivered incredible results. Guthrie was famously a sensible, mechanically minded rider. He knew how to get the best out of his bikes and play to his strengths. The golden period paid out in a big way, with possibly the most dominant display in the sport's history. Blitzing the field now at every turn, at every lap, an ever increasing gulf in quality, both in machinery and talent. Norton wins big, again and again. In these years, Norton won an outstanding 78 out of 100 major races they entered. Guthrie alone with 26 TDs and GPs to his name, not to mention the placements too. Add to that the fact that the team were instructed to take it in turns to win. Guthrie himself went on to garner 11 more medals on the Isle of Man. Not only that, but he personally held several world records simultaneously. Each win brought more momentum and confidence to the next race, but by no means did the medals come easily. Every win was hard earned, each with its own story, from last gasp winners, injuries and near misses, to total dominance across Europe. Guthrie himself described the dramatic scenes of the 1935 Ulster Grand Prix in this rare recording. The we don't feel critical to able to play like that. The best and humble thing is experience, it's all we have to Instantly, I took the model up in the sun. The foot rest is then, the gears are going to hand the bar's distance, and they first break out the track. A bit of trickle and tuning made me beautiful. Then I put the front in the bucket, and this is the back of the gears of the While all this is going on, the track is fast. So I gave the model a heave and jumped on. To my immense relief, he started. I flat down to it, I almost took them one by one, until as we passed the grandstand for the second time, I was lying at home with the needle in the feet. Using all I did, I eventually passed the other, and my six signals were to meet up. For nine more laps, I had something in hand, but expected every moment that some part which had been done from the track would get off the boat. To my joy, I ran and tried to it for the last time, to find that I had achieved two hundred, one to one the world's fastest motorcycle road to and the other is the first chap to win with an average speed of excess of 90 miles an hour. Guthrie and the Norton team must have well and truly felt untouchable. Having cruised at the top for an unquestionable period, there was no doubt they had all left their mark. On a personal front, Guthrie's stoic nature remained unchanged by his celebrity status, focused and professional, and still always trying to beat his own records. But with every year, competition gained an advantage. With a toddler in the house and another child on the way, retirement was now imminent for Jimmy. Despite all this, Guthrie was still doing well and planned to see out the season. The stakes higher than ever and so close to the finish line on his career, Jimmy made one last late season trip to Germany for the Grand Prix at Zaxenring. Guthrie in the lead, yeah, against the odds. The German spectators around with incredible numbers. Guthrie, the flying Scotland. Passing around France with only a lap to go, a healthy lead over the German favourite goal for BMW, the racing champion of Europe. Surely the race is his. Nine seconds in the lead. We're waiting at the grandstand. Should be passing now. Any second now. Any second. The German motorcycle Grand Prix brings out the fastest for a speed dash that is to end in tragedy. For in this race, Britain's star Jimmy Guthrie is killed. Details of the events around Guthrie's death had been speculated widely for a long time. And what was initially thought to be mechanical failure was later believed by some to be foul play from the nearest German rider. In any case, a terrible tragedy. 
the last photograph of Guthrie, shows him lying in state at Kirkall Hospital Chapel. Guthrie's casket was sent home alongside an honorary trophy. He was memorialised in Hoyt, in Germany on the track, and on the Isle of Man. And despite the tragedy, Guthrie finished as a beacon of pride and hope for this small town. Hoyt has since forged more sporting champions, including Steve Hislop. Though he graced the track so assuredly for so long, one has to wonder why he kept going. There are only questions left. What drives a champion? This humble man sought neither money nor fame. So why then risk your life when nothing else needs proven? He's not the first, and far from the last. Flying too close to the sun, over and over, until it rises no longer. Over and over, champions delight and inspire, but rarely reap the rewards of their hard work. Unless, the reward is the process. Doing what you love, and loving every second, because it can be gone in an instant. In the race of life then, there are no winners or losers, and no second chances. So be good to those who keep your engine running, and enjoy the ride. Very good.